So let's go ahead and get started. If, um, if I can just have like promise, it will be like 15 minutes, quick little stories. And I would love to just really have some conversation with you guys about what we're doing. Uh, my name is Z. I'm the founder of One Wallet. And today I just want to kind of talk about three simple little things about why you know, we're building a wallet and what is the larger context that we're building this from. And you really start with, you know, like the kind of our chief internet troll, you know, Elon Musk, the chief technical uh, king, according to his latest uh, SEC filing, which is more about how do we actually start demystifying Web3, metaverse, blockchain, crypto, and NFTs. So the point of this presentation is really more about just connecting the kind of technology with culture. And it really start with just kind of our simple story, our founder story. And I think the my entire team, most of us are coming from the world of computer science. Um, you know, the founders I have, uh, most of us, you know, kind of grew up just in a world of, um, you know, just programming. Uh, you know, we, most of us worked at these big tech companies, you know, whether it being Google or Apple. But the thing that I think is really interesting for me is really more about how do we actually start having this origin story? How does you know, once upon a time, you know, a software programmer connect with artists in LA. I think that's really important because I think there is a divide. You know, I'm based in you know, middle of Silicon Valley and there is a division in terms of the, the type of language we use, the things we care about. On the surface, it feels very different. You know, the engineers up in Silicon Valley, we talk, we talk in code. And artists down here in LA, you guys talk about culture, right? You guys talk about the human experience. What are some of the stories that are actually relevant to every individual? And for me, I think this is also kind of important because what I want to share is we're actually not that different. All, all of us, whether you're a software programmer or artist, you all have a fun, uh, kind of a humble beginning, right? This is kind of a picture that was taken 2019 when the company first started. Very much a Silicon Valley cliche, whether it being Apple or Google, we all have a tendency to start in a garage. So that's our story. It was middle of the winter. It's not AC heated, so it's pretty cold. You know, we don't have the sunny LA weather up, up north. Um, so all of us, you know, just for about six months, we're huddling. Um, by the way, this is a ping pong table. It's not even a real table, right? And you see all the messiness. It looks like a college dorm. And this is very stereotypical. All of us just huddling. And it's not even about like, hey, we know exactly what we, don't, we wanna do. I think a lot of time, you know, the, the art community feel like, well, the engineers are very robotic. They know exactly what they want to do. They're talking logic. But the reality is this. For the first six, six months, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We we're just talking ideas, sharing stories, and trying to figure out what problems are interesting to resolve. So that's kind of our story. Just like artists, we're all trying to figure out where to go and finding the reason why is what we're building remotely interesting and relevant to the larger society. So I think that's critically important if we're truly going to revolutionize Web3 the way it's been done very differently than the past two decades. And the next thing, you know, is really just more about how do kind of like, you know, the, the tech sector actually evolve and actually how do we actually chase, you know, just like, you know, many of the artists, we all have our insecurities, right? We all kind of have our problems to address. So many of us, you know, we tend to kind of go to different conferences and these are some of the pictures from my team members you know, just kind of really talking about, you know, going to, you know, the WWDC, right? Trying to like learn from the bigger te technology companies. You know, uh, the gentleman next to me, uh, his name is Jeff Ding. Uh, I know there are several Googlers here. He's kind of legendary, probably one of the most well-known software engineer at Google. So you're all, you know, just like, you know, in the art community, you have the kind of the, the people, the OGs, right? In, in the software industry, it's the same way. You have these legendary programmers that you learn from. So there is kind of a fundamental thread that's very much similar. You learn from the generation that came before you, and hopefully you can do something new and better by improving upon the original design. But it doesn't matter what you build, just like many artists, you know, in search of their kind of next great project, next great idea, I think there's always a yearning for something bigger and better, chasing down the uncertainties. And I love this famous quote, you know, you always have, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to gather woods but really kind of inspire them internally, have this deep passion to finding, having their own curiosity, to yearn for the kind of the immensity of the sea. 
And in so many ways, I think many of the Web3 projects, right, whether it being the layer one protocols or you know, the people who are working on DeFi protocols or even the latest generation of NFTs, we're all trying to figure this thing out. There are actually more unknowns than knowns. So that's kind of the part that's also very interesting. I think as an artist, you know, after talking to so many of um, you know, people, um, whether it be ETH Denver or South by Southwest or NFT NYC last year, many artists have the same thing. They're inspired by the uncertainties. Because if everything is certain, then there's, it's symbolic, it means there, will be any, there won't be any changes. But what makes artists and software engineers same is basically we're always curious about finding the next challenge, finding the unknown, and really coming up with creative solution to address that. And the only way you can bridge that gap is actually by telling a compelling story, making your idea shareable. And that's kind of the, really the deep connection between whether you're working on NFT or the next generation technology platform. And that's kind of the next topic I want to talk about, which is how do we actually make Web3 more welcoming, more inviting for the normies? Because truth be told, for the past 11 plus years, many of the technology protocols are evolving or designed for software engineers. The normal people on the street don't necessarily talk like a typical software engineer. So our goal when we're building One Wallet, which is the product we've been working on for the past six plus months, is this symbolically this idea of how do we make Web3 feels like that your initial on-ramp feels like your home. And I use the metaphor of home by borrowing the famous quote from um, Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks. About 15 years ago, right before Starbucks was about, was about about to go IPO. Someone asked him a really interesting question. What is Starbucks? Seemed very interesting, simple question. And I think he gave one of the best answer. Starbucks is the third place between home and work. And he defined it in such a way that it feels very inviting because there's enough room for anyone's imagination to fill in the gap. And how we define one wallet, the product we're building, is your home in the metaverse. Because if you think about it, Every morning when you wake up, usually start in your home. It feels safe. This is kind of where you're comfortable being who you are. And it doesn't matter what your day looks like. It doesn't matter how far you travel, whether it be on vacation or multi-year journey. There's always that little place you call home that beckons you back because that's kind of where you keep your valuables. That's also where you know you're loved. So one wallet, is a really good metaphor for building a home in a metaverse. And speaking of wallet, I just want to do a quick survey. How many of you guys use MetaMask on a weekly basis? How many of you actually started your Web3 journey using Coinbase? Raise your hand, please. Okay, okay. So the reason why I want to point this out is because Many of the normies are having very difficult time discerning what is a wallet, what is an exchange. And what I have here behind me are what I consider, you know, based on the research that we've been conducting for the past six plus months, some of the key critical variables to define what is a good wallet. Number one, I think that many of us in the technology sector need to realize, especially the early developers, that mobile is not gonna go away. Many of the wallets out there, including the original MetaMask, those are all based on desktop. And there's this kind of this crazy phenomenon in the past four, five plus, four plus years where many of the hardcore developers assume mobile is going to go away, that many of us will go back to desktop and spend most of our time in front of a computer. And that was somewhat accentuated by the past two years of the pandemic. But the reality is, more and more, as more people get on top of um, kind of like building on top of Web3, mobile is going to become more important. So some of the walls are becoming, mobile becoming more of a prominent first-class citizen. And the second thing is obviously NFT. It's a fairly recent phenomenon in the past 14 months. And not that many wallets out there have native NFT support. And when I say native support, I don't mean just showcasing the image. I'm talking about accentuating all the metadata, all the composability of NFT. And also maybe even, call it crazy, maybe be able to directly connect with artists behind the NFT work directly within your wallet. So these ideas are not baked into some of the best wallets out there. And this one's actually very near close to my heart because if you heard the panel talking about it, 
many of the artists today, they don't feel there's a sense of ownership. And ownership doesn't mean just, well, do I have custody of the artwork, but really ownership in terms of all the value that's being created on top of the work that you produce. So self-custody is critical, critically important in this context. If it's not your key, then it's not your coins. If it's not your NFT directly hosted within your wallet, then technically you don't own it. You cannot accrue value for it. And second to, the, the second variable I think is also critically important is this idea of that there's, especially among the developers, there is kind of this like religious attachment to certain protocols or to certain layer one solutions where they feel like, well, for Bitcoin to win, Ethereum has to lose. Or for Solana to win, every other protocol needs to kind of disappear. But the reality is we're quickly entering into this universe of interoperability. Just like many of you, you may like certain artists, you may like certain directors. For one director to win, for one artist to win, the other artist doesn't have to lose. It's not a zero sum game. And network interoperability just means that. We have to start treating these networks as interoperable. So not all the wallets out there are supporting multiple protocols. And that's another critical variable we think about. And last but not least, security. How many of you heard about these recent, you know, hacks or you know, people losing their tokens because it got hacked, right? Many of you have heard of it. So security is not just a feature, it's an evergreen principle that you always have to be vigilant from a software development perspective to make sure that you're taking care of your users. So I just wanna highlight, these are some of the key problems after talking to thousands of normies, what they're facing whenever they encounter a wallet. Many of them complain about, it's very difficult to use, it's hard to understand, and majority of the user interface feels it's designed for you know, the kind of the DGENs. They're not necessarily for the normies. And the user interface feels like it was a pain nostalgia back to the early 2000s, or even worse, the 1990s. So the user interface and the user experience needs to be dramatically improved. And this is kind of how we think about it, right? Number one, the security piece, the hardcore technology behind these wallets needs to be completely abstracted away from the everyday users. So for us, the starting point is about removing C phrase and private keys. Because those are computer friendly terminologies, but they're not human readable. So how do we remove that without actually giving away the custody of your wallet? So we have a really good solution by abstracting away the private keys directly onto the secure enclave within your, heart, uh, within your uh, smartphones. So you don't have to write those down on a piece of paper anymore. Or even worse, most people just take a photo of their private keys and upload it to the cloud. That's not safe, that's not secure. So we have a really good solution for that. And some of the key elements that I wanna talk about is also, you know, we are also embracing. Web3 is very different than Web2 in the sense that all the software piece that we have is open sourced. And what that means is every developer out there, you can literally just do a command C, a command V, equivalent, and make your own version of the wallet. So that way, the, the technology behind what we're doing is completely transparent. And the end user are not happy with the work that we're delivering. There will be some developers out there that can easily make a replica of it and hopefully make improvement on the original. So that's a critical piece, how we're gonna make, make sure that we're keeping ourselves honest and making sure we deliver the end value to our users. So before a single line of code were developed in the past six months, we always ask ourselves this question. Can the wallet we're developing pass a toothbrush test? And this is a famous test that was made uh, available inside of Google. Um, when Larry Page was still the CEO of Google, he always asked, if you're gonna add a new feature to any major product, does it pass a toothbrush test? And what that means is, a toothbrush, if you think about it, is something that you use twice a day. It doesn't matter how old you are, what your social economic status is, your gender, and where you're based, you're gonna use it every day. And probably most of us can agree, the benefits of using a toothbrush is undeniable. So every software feature that you develop should pass a toothbrush test. So that's a conversation that I have with my team almost on a weekly basis. And this is a critical thing to make sure that what we're doing is not just for the sake of technology, but it's really for the creating value for our users. The second thing 
The second principle that we always talk about within our team is, are we developing a product with a user experience that feel like a pair of eyeglasses? And what that means is, if you think about it, a pair of glasses disappears when we put it on. The glasses itself is not really the, the main prominent feature. It enables you to see a little bit better. It amplifies your power or the lack of ability to focus. So that's what a pair of glasses is supposed to do. And when we're developing our product, the one wallet, we want to make sure the user interface almost fades into the background so the users can focus on the things that, that's most important to them. Last but not least, because you know, we truly see one wallet, and actually for the matter of fact, for Web3, it really truly is a duet of culture and technology. And what that really means is the product really needs to make you feel differently. It needs to bring a, some form of joy, some form of a happiness. And if you think about it, there's no other product that does that better than a photograph. A photo really captures a moment in time. And it's almost like a time machine that takes you back and forth. It makes you feel a certain way. And a great product should always make you feel differently every time you look at it. Because we're always changing. The artwork itself within the actual product may also be evolving depending on what you're looking at. So it needs to feel emotive. So I'm going to take a quick pause here. Um, for those of you who are interested with the iPhone, you're more than welcome to join the uh, test flight and check, check it out. And I'll be speaking, I'll be in the backstage if you guys want to um, chat, up, chat up a little bit more about it. But let's move on to the next one. All right. So what we have developed in a beta is really based on these three key pillars. Number one, how do we make the hard things easy and how do we make the easy delightful? So for those of you who get a chance to test our beta, hopefully we deliver this promise. The second thing is, we want to make the user interface not only intuitive or self-explanatory, it should almost talk back to you. It should almost seem back to you so that it, it really feels like it's actually alive. And last but not least, any software product is not based on the interpretation of the creator. It's based on the self-expression of the user. So that's another critical component within One Wallet. And hopefully, you know, when you guys get a chance to um, join our beta testing program, you, you can help us either validate or invalidate what we're promising to deliver. So here are the seven key product feature pillars. Uh, you don't need to remember any one of them. There's only one word. And actually, as a matter of fact, if there's only one word you remember from this hopefully conversation is one wallet is social. And what that means is we have built for the first time within a crypto wallet, a non-custodial crypto wallet, a wallet to wallet chat. So no longer when you're, when you're sending a token to someone, you don't have to ask them, hey, what is your wallet address? And just, hey, get, let's get on Telegram. Let me copy and paste to Telegram or some instant messaging app. And then you have to copy and paste back into your wallet. And because you already went through four or five steps, you want to send out a test token and you have to send a message to you get that token. And then you send a full transaction. That's seven or eight steps. By building a wallet to wallet communication, sending a token should be as easy and as fast as sending a text message. So social means just that. And it's not just about a one-to-one -one communication. Let's say all of us here in this audience, we create a group a wanna, and we want to create a, you know, we, heard, we probably heard about you know, the pizza DAO. And we maybe, you know, for us here in LA, we want to create a burrito DAO. If we all join this group, we can easily create a DAO with a simple tap of a button. And because we have everyone's wallet address, we can all deposit fund into that wallet. Or, you, you know, better yet, you, maybe there's an artist that we all want to support in the audience. We can easily create a group and by connecting our wallet together, we can send funds directly to the artist or maybe buy that NFT as a group as opposed to an individual. So social has a much greater implication. And it turns out after 30 plus years, social is still the killer app. Communication is fundamental to every generation of the internet from web one 
even prior to the, the first generation internet. Many of you probably remember the initial funding for the internet by DARPA was actually designed to, in case there's a nuclear um, war, we can still communicate. And then from the ICQ days, from in, uh, instant messenger to the recent generations of WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, chat is fundamental to every generation of the internet. And we're doing, we're doing so by making it completely uh, on-chain for the communication. That's what social also means in the context of one wallet. Do you mind hit play, Devin, please? Oh, I guess this is a PDF. Uh, but what I was gonna show you, just you know, a 30 second fly through of the user interface. Uh, and then you know, what you see here is basically someone creating a group chat and just having a normal conversation it could be something as simple as like, hey, I paid for your pizza last night or I paid for the beer last week. Send me some tokens to pay for it. And you don't have to copy and paste the address anymore. And I think this is kind of a first baby step to making Web3 less intimidating and more friendly and more accessible for everyday normies. And let me just kind of travel back in time a little bit for the past you know, 60 days to kind of show you where we've been, right? This was me on stage at East Denver. Um, I love the Samuel L. Jackson. Um, you know, I think he has one of the best wallets out there, right? Uh, from Pulp Fiction. Uh, so that was me just kind of giving you a kind of an early preview of one wallet. And we call this fish food. Uh, fish fooding, for those of you who are not familiar, is basically as you're conceiving or building the product, you're actually testing it with early users. And this is as, this is as early as it gets. But because of the open nature of one wallet development, and because we want to make sure that we're not developing from the perspective of a bunch of Silicon Valley nerds, we're inviting as many people as possible to test out the product. So we start fish fooding at ETH Denver. And this is when we start evolving. Uh, this is about two weeks ago at ETH Austin. We start kind of getting on the street. When I say normies, I mean normies. I mean, going to 6th Street when people are half drunk on a Saturday night or Saturday evening, asking them to download one wallet. And roughly about 15 of us, you know, were roaming down the streets in Austin for about four or five days, getting regular people to download a wallet. Some of the conversations were interesting. There were a lot of, also a lot of, you know, 2 a.m., you know, F-bomb, you know, go away, you know, it's, you know, or, you know, people, even, quite frankly, some of the normies are also saying, you know what, my, uh, my parents actually told me, um, stay away from crypto. It's illegal or it's a scam, right? So that's kind of the larger world we're dealing with, but dog fooding is really important. Because dog fooding allow us to have a much broader perspective of the target user, the target demographic we're going after. So again, it's not about us building a product and hope they'll come. Because those days are over. You have to be able to open up to the community, just like the art scene. It's not what the creator says, it's how the fans are receiving it. Same with technology, especially in the context of Web3. It's what the user actually are telling you, whether your product is good or not. So we need to be open about it. And last but not least, uh, we're ready to launch this on uh, one wallet in the coming month. And these are just kind of high level features that we're uh, highlighting. And I just want to kind of point it out. I'm very excited, obviously. Um, number one, you know, for the next five plus years, and hopefully even longer, we're going to invite every possible artist onto this platform we're building to build, to create, and to design. And the reason why I say that is a wallet, just a wallet. It's just a utility. It doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have a spirit. But if you really think about it, the reason why LA is so relevant as a cultural capital of US and sold one of the biggest export out of US is because LA has a unique property of understanding music, sports, film, entertainment, and fashion. And those are the things that actually really bind the human spirit together. And many of us, especially in the kind of the technology scene, we, we fundamentally do realize this. More often than not, we think too much and we feel too little. And there's nothing like culture that really makes you feel in different, in different ways. So what we're doing is we're inviting as many artists onto this platform to create value, not for us, not for the platform, because one of the key phrases I use is, one wallet is non-custodial. So whatever you create, whatever wallet address you accumulate, you as an artist have a direct line of communication with your fan base. It's not owned by 
let's say, you know, Facebook or Instagram or Google. It's very different than the Web2 era. And some other key critical features you know, I'm very excited about, which is the decentralized basic income. Whatever tokens that you receive with a single tap of a button, you can stake it with, without any lock-in. So view this as a, almost an instantaneous uh, savings account. And on average, you get about 20% yield. Hopefully the SEC is not in the audience. Uh, this is not a promissory note. It's based on the average of the past 18 months. The Anchorage protocol we're integrating within one wallet yields about 20%. And there are other kind of interesting features that we're prototyping right now, which is a decentralized, um, what I call AR, um, AR graffiti, which is a reference to Pokemon Go. So instead of a one company that allows you to drop digital artifacts around the world, any artist now can publish or NFT at any physical location. You can make that completely private. So you only, you, you're the only person can see it by connecting your wallet to that physical location. Or you can say, you know what, it's controlled, just like YouTube unlisted. So people who know the exact location can see it, or you can make it completely public. So that's an interesting kind of a concept we're inventing with one wallet called Air uh, Graffiti. Um, and last but not least, um, by July of this year, we're going to be at Paris uh, ETHCC um, ETH uh, launching the Android version. So that's a critical path for us to kind of reach a much broader audience. And we're very much excited about that. Uh, so that's it. Um, you know, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, you know, uh, find me in the back of the audience and very much excited to uh, onboard everyone who are interested in testing out one wallet beta. Thank you so much.